Gentlemen, 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 so gl glad to have you here today. It's great to have a fellowship of brothers like this. I'm glad we could all gather together this Advent season and, and hear and learn of great wisdom that uh, Stephen Crotts will be bringing today. A um, couple of things I wanted to mention. One, I want to thank Amity for hosting us. And um, here's the, uh, the $3 we give you every month. Just um, And uh, we appreciate it. Um, also wanted to introduce um, David Hamblett. Yeah, here's David. He's a friend of mine. He's going to, you know, a lot of you know Brian Pell, who's been here before and started a church in my church building. And uh, that's how I met David over at Brian's church. And uh, David's a talented guy, I can tell you. Um, if you ever want to learn how to really tie-dye a T-shirt, I mean, really cool this guy is Ruby. a pro. We're gonna, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna try to get my son's uh, 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 trail life group to get together and do it. He's is amazing, and he knows how to get the right dyes that give you the real good. Ah, oh, he's he's a pro. Far so anyway, out. far out, dude. <laughs> yeah, right. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, also, wanted to make an announcement. I understand that Bob Damaris's daughter, Sh Shelly, uh, recently passed away. And um, so I thought if we could just take a minute, anybody who wants to join me, we could come pray over Bob and, uh, you know, his family and uh, let him know how much, you know, we love him and uh, how glad we are that he's part of our group, part of our family. So, um, Okay. Yeah, I uh, I asked Steve to do that. Uh, my wife and I have been knowing Bob and his wife Brenda for gosh ten years, something like that, or whatever. Been in their small group, and uh, he's been telling us for years and years that they have a daughter named Shelly who was uh going through cancer. Was it was it bone marrow? Oh, okay. Anyway, she was fighting and in remission and i think it was probably five years since he when he first mentioned that she they had a daughter going through cancer for about five years and then just uh uh back in uh november early november uh bob joined my wife and i at the emergency chaplain banquet for for dinner and they let us know because our small group kind of went different directions there so we hadn't seen Brenda in a while, his wife, and that's when Bob let me know that their daughter Shelly had passed with cancer. So uh, I, I think it'd be really great. Uh, I know, I know he's grieving. In fact, if I can be so bold, uh, Stephen Cross, you're you're familiar with grief. Uh, so maybe you could lead that prayer, and we could all, whoever wants to get up, or if you if you want to do the the distance thing and lay hands on Bob. Thank you, Lord, that some of our best prayers are wordless, just yearnings and hopes and sighs and groans that are too deep for words. You hear them and give articulation to that prayer in your spirit. God of all comfort, you who had no one to dry your tears, you who gave your only begotten son, for our sins, you know. Touch this dear brother and comfort him. Give him a constructive grief. And receive into the portals of heaven his beloved daughter. In Jesus' name, amen. You gotta watch this chair. It'll throw you down and jump on you. Perfect. Yeah. Merry Christmas to you. And thanks for bringing the chocolate. What a delightful way of thinking of us. We'll always look at you now and drool. The text today is from Luke 19, chapter 10. If you ask the question, why did he do it? Here's what Jesus said. For the Son of Man came to seek 
and to save the lost. In the second text from Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, verse 3, a bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. Let us pray. Lord, it's hard to get our mind around the facts of Christmas, that you who shaped the world took shape among us to redeem the world. We know we deserved your judgment, but you came as a suffering servant, as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, and we receive you humbly and needfully in faith. But we know you'll come again, Lord, in the second advent as the Lion of Judah, first in mercy and second in judgment. Oh, how we long to be among that number of the faithful who have loved your appearing. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Go back to um, the fall of 1971. I'm a student in London, England. The Bloomsbury District, that's uh, the writer's district near the theaters. Delightful place to go to school. And my billet is on the ninth floor of the Ivanhoe Hotel. Uh, there's a window in my small student room, but it looks out over a six-foot alleyway into a tenant house next to us. And the windows are suited up appropriately with London fog or coal smoke. And one of the window panes is broken out, and I'm constantly brushing my teeth at that window. And, and I see this broken window, and I, I can make out that somebody has taken a photograph of a man and ripped it from its flame, frame and cut it to make a cardboard window pane. And over the months that I went to school and constantly brushed my teeth and looked out there, I found myself wondering about that man in the photograph. Uh, who was he? Why'd they take his picture? What ugly circumstances came that his picture was not worth any more than a stuffing to keep the coal out on the ninth floor of a tenant building? Do you ever feel like that, out of place, wasted, fading away, shoved in some ignominious hole? So many of our world have become so. Refugees today, mental patients, prisoners, sometimes wards of a retirement home, a business executive in the merger mania that gets downsized, a divorcee. And I can speak for myself as a widower. Sociologists call us the throwaway generation. I remember making a fortune as a young man, getting pop bottles, two cents oh. each. I'd get 50 out of the ditches and have enough to take a girlfriend uh, to a movie and buy some popcorn too. But now we just drink our pop and discard the bottle. Uh, the same with cans. I remember refilling ink pens as a young person, don't you? And now we use the pen till it uses its ink up and we throw the whole thing away. Razors. Watching my dad strop a razor. That was a, a liturgy of growing up. Oh, what a manly thing to do. And now we use our razors till they're dull and throw them away. This is transferred in our generation to people. We throw away children in abortion clinics. More and more, we're throwing away the elderly with euthanasia. We throw away people in the penal system. We throw away spouses we don't want anymore in divorce court. It used to be if you, if you had that job with the SAS Institute or with IBM or with Merck, you were set for life. And now a company will down, downsize you in your 50s, peak of your earnings, and hire two young people in your place feel that it was a good deal. I was decorating the Christmas tree in my front yard a few years back, 
when a car pulled up, it was smoky. He cut the engine off and it continued to run until it backfired and finally cut off. And now it comes a familiar face, Bobby, big as a bear. He was the linebacker for Elon College in 1979 when they won the national championship. And I remember Bobby in the Bible studies there. How you doing? I said, Bobby. And a liturgy of pain spilled out of his life. A single. Won't no woman have me, he said. Friendless. Unemployed. Unemployable. Broke. Wanted to hit me up for 10 bucks or some gas just to get back over to Elon, where he hoped he could get a free place to stay in a dorm. Paranoid schizophrenic. Diagnosed but untreated, he couldn't afford his medicine. And as he told me, I survive on beer, cigarettes, and television. What an abysmal life. All the hurt, the loneliness, the waste. It was a, a linebacker, a man that was going someplace. And in the gauntlet of life, he just got the crap beat out of him and just lost all hope and sense of respectability. And I'll never forget in that Christmas season a few years back when Bobby leaned against my doorpost and he said, Stephen, you're a student of that book. What does your God say about people like me? Is he even aware that people like me exist? Yes, Bobby, there is something Jesus would say to you. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's look at Jesus's words a little more closely for the next few minutes and, and see why did he do it? Why did he come? There's a sign on the natural bridge of Virginia that says GW, and it's supposed to be George Washington's initials. And I know for a fact he is supposed to have carved his initials there as a surveyor, but over the years, the, the carving faded and the state of Virginia repaints it every now and then. So George Washington was here is very clear. Any of you are into art, you remember the painter Goya. And the painting that's considered the first painting of a modern artist is called The Executions. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, the backstory of the painting, has invaded Spain. His army is demoralized and brutalized, defeated thoroughly the Spanish army. And they're coming into the capital of Madrid, and they're mopping up resistance. And in this painting, you see a, a white wall pocked with blood and bullet holes. And standing in the middle of a pile of bodies is this one Madrid peasant soldier, probably a farmer, who took up arms, and, and he has a look of terror on his face, and his arms are widespread, like he's about to be crucified. And he's standing knee-deep in bodies of his fellow Madridites. Uh, they've been shot by the fusillade, the firing squad. And you look at the, the French, you don't see their faces, but you see their helmets and their accoutrements, their uniforms, and their backs are to you. And they're leaning into their guns, getting ready to fire and execute this man. And he, he has a look of total abandonment or hopelessness on his face. Now, it's the background of the painting that's really interesting because you see a, a gray sky, what we call a closed sky, no help up there. And, and you see the gray background of the city against the night. And one of the buildings you see is the cathedral in the middle of the city. But it's closed. The doors are shut. There's no light on in it. Now, if you compare that painting to medieval painting heretofore, they have an open sky. You, you might see a man getting shot here on earth, but you see the heavens open and God on his throne judging right and wrong, his angels ascending and descending. You see Jacob's ladder. And you see the order of heaven, but the chaos of the earth. And God is available to creation, and he's coming to put it right, even though it's not put right yet. But in this first painting 
of modern art, closed sky. There is no God. The church is irrelevant. It's just you and your existential life of suffering and the terror that every human being feels. First painting of modern art. Look it up. I think you'll find it incredibly striking. The text says that God not only came, he was here, he came here, and he still is here. In theology, we call it the omnipresence of God. So don't let the text, the Son of Man came. He, he used to be here, but he's not here anymore. Um, many people, um, Thomas Jefferson included, are what we call deist. They believe in deism, that God created the heavens and the earth, but he wound it up like an alarm clock, and he set it on the shelf of the universe, and it's ticking away for that final alarm but God hasn't come back and been present to the universe. This text totally drunks that. God came after he created. He was here. He is here. He will be forever here. Remember the name he took at Christmas? Emmanuel. What does it mean? God is with us. God is with us. So the Son of Man came. Now look at the next word in the text. The Son of Man came to seek. When I was in Israel a number of times over the years, I used to carry a map with me, and any village we went in where Christ did something, I would mark the map and write in the margins what he did. To sick beds, the disciples on the Sea of Galilee, in the hills for the Sermon on the Mount, into the tiny village of Nain, on the cross. He was there for people. I love the story of him on the cross where he, he turns to the guy that says, remember me, and he ministers to him. Or I, I really love Christ's last miracle before his greatest miracle. You know what it was? Healing the ear of Malchus when Peter cut his ear off. Here Jesus is about to die, and he, he has the strength and the concern for even one of his enemies to feel around in the dark on the ground till he finds a bloody ear. And I don't know what he did with it, but he reaffixed it to him. Uh, Jesus is a seeker. I did the math one time and, and found that I estimated Christ probably walked about 2,200 miles in the three years of his active itinerant ministry. There's hardly a place in Israel where his shadow didn't fall. Even today, God seeks us in alcoholism. He seeks us in our pride and busy, moneyed life. He seeks us in rest homes or on the 10th floor tenement house with a broken window that has our picture stuffed into it. There's a cartoon of Dennis the Menace speaking to Joey about Mr. Wilson. And he says, Joey, don't ever hide with, don't ever play hide and seek with Mr. Wilson. You hide, but he doesn't seek. <laughs> I played that game with my children and grandchildren before, but God's not playing that game. He seeks. The Son of Man came to seek. Now, notice the next word in the text is the word the lost. He came to seek the lost. And this brings us to our second text. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking wick he will not quench. And there are two beautiful poetic images here of what Jesus would have called lawless, um, of what Jesus would have called uh, lostness. The first, a bruised reed. The reed was a, a musical instrument, usually two of them tied. Yeah, it's going to come back in. As long as you can see their face, it's going to come back in. Thank you. You guys, Wi Fi. No sound on Zoom. Two hundred pictures later, I'm seeing spots before my eyes. I've been down on these old knees on a concrete tiled floor, and I'm beginning to hurt. 
So I, I get up and I say, well, David, let's head for the barn. And another nurse came and says, I, I hate to ask you this, but there's a lot of people who are bedridden and they really wanted to come and they've heard you're here. Would you mind going down the hall? And I said, what do you think, son? He said, yeah, let's do it, dad. So we start down the hall, all these sweet people in bed, getting a picture with them on their pillow, uh, giving them a blessing. Ho, ho, ho. And about 35 bedridden patients later, people say, well, you know, you're going to see Zeke, aren't you? I said, of course, we'll see Zeke. Where's Zeke? Who's Zeke? Oh, he lives on the left at the end of the hall. You're going to go see Zeke, aren't you? I said, sure, sure, we're going to go find Zeke. Well, we get to the end of the hall and we go in Zeke's room. Now, Zeke is a man about my age that's shaped like a pretzel. I don't know what he's got, but his spine is bent. His legs won't uncurl. He's just all contorted. He doesn't look like he's in pain, but he definitely looks like a pretzel. And he is the biggest Carolina fan I have ever met. He had a football helmet of Carolina for his light by his bed. He had tar heels on his sheets and on his blanket. His pajamas had UNC all over them. Everything in his room was Carolina blue. And uh, he, he couldn't talk when he, when he talked. He kind of talked like this. Low. I said, how's that again, Zeke? Forms have been in low. And the nurse said, I don't know what that means, but he keeps saying forms are bending low. And I looked at Zeke and the life that he had known, and I said, yes, Zeke, forms are bending low. But God has bent low to be with us. And I gave him a blessing, kissed him on the forehead. David and I jumped in the car, loaded it up, and we got our um, obligatory chocolate chip cookie and Coca-Cola riding home. And uh, we talked about that strange man, but we couldn't figure him out. We had supper, and then it was time for the midnight Christmas Eve service at Christ Church. And we went in, and the first hymn we sang, it came upon a midnight clear. And I think it's the second or third stand-up. And ye beneath life's crushing load, whose forms are bending low, look now for glad and golden hours come swiftly on the wing. And I looked up at David, and David looked at me, and he was crying. I started crying a little bit, too. Zeke had the hope that the Son of Man came to seek lost people like him. Now, there's a, a fourth and final word we need to focus on, probably the most of all in this passage, where Jesus explains why he did it. And it's the word save. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, in the Greek, the word saved can be translated to be removed from a place of confinement to a, a place of exceeding freedom, a place of a exceeding open space. Or many people just translate saved as health. So if a good Baptist says to you, are you saved? He's inquiring of your health. Are you healthy in your relationship with God, with your neighbor, with yourself, with the environment? Are you saved? So you're inquiring of the person's well-being. And the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost, to seek the lost and to bring health to them. Now, Let's look at the name Jesus Christ and how his very name elucidates the whole idea of being saved or salvation. What would you have called Jesus if he walked into this Bible study and took a seat on a middle row and was just one of us? Would you say, we're glad to have Jesus Christ with us today? No, no, that would be wrong. His name was Yeshua or Hosef or, or Joshua, we pronounce Yeshua, Joshua. Bar, son of Joseph, Joseph, the name which means he adds. So his real name in his day would be, hey, there's Jesus Bar Joseph. So how do you get from Yeshua Bar Joseph to Jesus Christ? Well, the New Testament wasn't written in Hebrew. 
it translated Christ's name from the Hebrew to the Greek. And the Greek name for Joshua is Jesus, which means health giver. And they dropped the name Bar, son of Joseph. And in Hebrew, they gave him the name of their hope, the Messiah. But Messiah was translated from Hebrew into Greek, which means Christ, or the anointed one. So when you say Jesus Christ, you're saying the one God anointed to bring health. The one God anointed to bring health. So why did Jesus come? God anointed him and sent him in to bring health to the world. And the text asks us that question today. Do you have this health? Is your dimly burning wick? giving light and less smoke? Are you making music in the gospel with that merry little penny whistle he gave you? Do you know that there's hope for somebody like you and like Bobby? I remember in the mid-1960s when color TV came to Alamance County, North Carolina. We had our black and white TV all cut on and ready to go. And they announced that at 4 o'clock on a Saturday, TV was going from black and white to color. Four o'clock came. We were still watching in black and white. Got my brother up on the roof to twist the antenna and add a little tin foil. Still watching in black and white. We called the studio up complaining, and they said, well, what kind of unit are you watching it on? We said, we've got this 13-inch uh, black and white. There's your problem. We're broadcasting in color, but you don't have the receiver to receive it in color. And we said, oh. And then we went to dad and said, why don't we have a color TV? You know what a dad would tell you in 1954? I'm waiting for them to perfect it. After it's proven itself for two or three years, we'll get a color TV. And sure enough, in 1957, color came to the Crotch household. God is broadcasting this incredible message of Christmas. And you receive it. What does he say about people like you and me? The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In a dimly burning wick he wouldn't quench, and a bruised reed he would not break. Come find our lives, Lord, broken as we are. We yield ourselves to you. Breathe on us, faithfulness, Lord. Quicken us to new life. Make us your disciple. Take us out of that horrid, cold hold of anonymity and hopelessness that we filled for so many years. And fill us with delight again, the knowledge that we have a light to shine and a song to sing. Make us your Christian son and daughter, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Something to disagree with or... Something in the text you understood, which we overlooked. Anybody want to share? Um, let me just apologize to the people online because we lost the internet connection here briefly. And I think when we reconnected, um, we were muted. So we're sorry for that, but thanks for letting us know. I think it was Shakespeare that said the course of technology never did run smooth. Yeah. Okay. My name is Phil Long from Whiteville, North Carolina. I came here over the dream. I've been helping a lot of people. A lot of people have been helping me, you know, just one day at a time. If you put the Lord first, he'll put you first. And I remember what I want to say. Um, it's not about yesterday, it's about tomorrow. It's about healing the past, living the present, dreaming the future. And if you forgive, you will be forgiven. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. That's it. We're glad you're here. Make yourself a regular. They're friends to be had here. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Good. Anybody else? 
I just know that since I've been found that I realized that was when I realized just how lost I was. It wasn't until Jesus actually got my attention long enough for me to pay attention and learn of him because it says taste and see that the Lord is good. And once I was willing to try that, that I found out, wow, he is good and he wants me to be good. And, uh, and, and look back and see where I was and realize that I was in a pit. I was lost. I didn't even know which way to turn. And every place I kept turning was a place where I was failing. And, uh, so I, just that whole idea that, that I was lost really came to me in this message today, because that is so true. And you don't know your law. You don't realize how lost you are. Just think, you know, well, let me try, let me try this. Let me try that. You know, and you're <laughs> not looking up. You're, you know, you're you guys, still lost. You guys remember back in the sixties and seventies, Empress Crusade had a evangelistic outreach called I found it. Remember that you see bumper stickers. I found it. I just such terrible theology. I wasn't looking for God. I didn't figure God out or go find him. He found me. The, Initiative of salvation never starts with people. It started with God. That's one of the first tenets of Presbyterianism, and it should be for every denomination. He found me. I wasn't looking, but he found me. Somebody asked um, this uh, British Malcolm Muggeridge mm -hmm. uh, journalist why he was converted to Christ when he was 72 years old. And he said, well, you, you see, I wasn't looking for God. I didn't want there to be a God. I didn't need there to be a God. But I had to come to reality that God wanted me. And uh, that's a powerful statement of good theology. Someone else. Eric, Eric online has something. Eric? Yeah, yeah. good evening. Good afternoon, brothers. Um, it's... In my younger years, I didn't do Bible studies because when I did, people weren't qualified. They were just arguing about changing the Bible. And to belong to a Bible study now um, and have Stephen Crofts, a theologian, talk to us about the different names of God, it's just incredible for me to hear the truth from a qualified person. Um, it's so magnificent. And it goes right down the line at West End. Um, with um, every time I come, I'm just rewarded by the word of God. Um, there's no doubt about it. It's not a question. It's fact. And that's what we get from this Bible study is fact every time. Might get into sports a little bit, but the fact is, is God's the word. And thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you, Eric. Anybody else have an insight or question? Disagreement? One of the uh, things that I wrote about in a news editorial this week, I think, is in this text. Christianity can neither be liberal nor conservative, nor can it be moderate. Um, it's liberal in the offer of the gospel to wretched sinners. Um, it's conservative in the immutability of God, his character or holiness, his law never changes. And it's moderate when it teaches us how we should treat our enemies, to love them and pray for them. And uh, these battles that Christians put on between the progressives and the conservatives are, are really false trumps. It's a uh, it's a tool of Satan, but the gospel is um, very layered in its conservatism, liberality, and um, moderatism. And we're called to be the right sort of conservative, liberal, moderate person in each situation. You put that in your pipe and smoke it. I like the... Uh use today of the word lost 
I think if our culture were to analyze where people are from a non-spiritual standpoint, it's never lost or found. It's always going through a phase or they're doing their own thing. And, you know, there's only two types of people lost or found. I've had the privilege this fall semester to add one more Bible study to my week. And it meets Wednesday night in my home with some young men. And that's a real challenge for me because they come from a different culture and different background, but all believers. And one of the questions we've been kicking around is, in their language, how do I get my neighbor saved? How do I get my relative saved? And my comeback to that is typically, that's not the hard part. The hard part is getting them lost. And they say, what do you mean? So well, you're not going to reach out to the offer of the, of the seeking Lord for salvation until you realize you're lost. And uh, the only equivalent we have today probably that helps that is our Uh, GPS units in our car. If you ignore where they say to turn left or right, you get hopelessly lost. And John Orberg tells a story of being so irritated with the unit in his rental car, he turned it off. As the lady kept saying, uh, when safe, uh, negotiate a U-turn. He didn't want to hear that, so he turned it off. Well, he got so far lost in the woods, in desperation mode, he turned it back on. And he says, do you know what that lady said to me at that moment? You wretched, disobedient guy. I'm not going to help you now. No. All the lady said was, when safe, negotiate a U-turn. And I use that to say that's how we should lead people when they realize they're in the woods lost. You don't scold them and say, you messed up. You, You get what you deserve. When safe. Repent, which is do a U-turn. And so maybe that's a good help. If you have a friend who's lost and realizes they're lost, it's it's time to negotiate a U-turn. We have a saying, people don't need Jesus till they need Jesus. And uh, I think John Owens, the Puritan, put it well. He said, where sin is counted bitter, salvation is counted sweet. But where you don't believe anything's a sin anymore, there's... There's no drive to Christ. That really is the worst kind of lostness. Just kind of adding to what Steve just said, in all of the 12-step groups, the very first step is in recognizing that there's a problem, Whether, and that applies here. Whether you recognize that you're lost or you recognize that you're Hooked on something. Uh, it's the same thing. Real realization is the first step uh to redemption. Yeah. Carl Bart is not one of my favorite theologians, but he did say very truthfully, I believe, um, man's greatest problem is realizing he has a problem. Well, Stephen Ellis's um comment really made me realize why there's more women in church than men because men don't stop and ask for directions because they don't think they're lost. What's the matter with that? (laughs) I've never been lost in my life. Just a mite bewildered here and there. I miss my wife getting her map out and rattling it. Just... (laughs) I know where I am. Put that map up. Uh, Stephen, where is the uh, word picture? Well, I think of the picture of if you cling to your life, you'll save it. That also fits with this. But where is the picture of Christ being like the hound of heaven? And you see that. Yeah, I, I picture this hound just really coming after. I've, I've even prayed that for people. Lord, just yeah. go after that person. Yeah. <laughs> that comes from the. Who wrote that poem? I fled him down the hallways. I fled him down the years of my life. He was the hound of heaven who knew my scent and came after me. That's not in the Bible, but it is in a poem. A poem. So we okay. may, not sure. Uh, on another funny, I think it was Chuck Swindoll gave the, it has nothing to do with this, but it was, we were talking about being lost. It's about the man and the woman going to a wedding and, he wouldn't stop for directions or anything. And 
they passed the same thing three times. And he pulled over and he looked at his wife and he says, okay, I know we're lost, but we're making great time and headed out again. <laughs> Francis Thompson. Yep. Francis Thompson. Well, let's close in prayer. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Praise the Lord. For he alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy. Thee Christ the Lord. And peace be with you. Got a quick, uh, if I have your attention real quick, uh, two weeks from today, we are going to present the awesome offering, love offering that you guys are generously providing to our teachers and appreciation for them. And I'm going to ask you all to help me out. I need your help. Uh, for all you procrastinators like me, don't wait until that present presentation day to give me your money. Now, the, the cash I can kind of deal with, but if you give me a check on the day that we're presenting, what am I supposed to do? Cut it in quarters and give it to the guys? <laughs> so please help me out. If you can, get it in either by mailing it to me. Steve's given my address on the, on the emails. Uh, either by mailing it to me or in the basket next week. Please, that would be so appreciated. Thank you. To John Wells, to John Wells, because he's the treasurer. Steve's been in his email that he sends out about our meeting. He's got at the bottom my address, and you can send me a check if you would like to me. Yeah, we don't have a Bible study, uh, or uh, we're not we're not officially incorporated or anything like that. We don't have a Bible study bank account, so uh, I will. Huh? John Wells, is that who you are? Yeah, John Wells. And uh, anyway, get it to me. And uh, I'm doing a little bit different. Last week, last year, I uh, went to the bank about four or five times, and I got cash so that I could deposit your checks and then uh, and, and then replenish it, uh, put, pay, put my, my money in there to cover it, so, you know, even it out. But I made like four or five trips to the bank. This year, I decided I'm just going to hold all the checks that I've been getting until just a couple of days prior to the, the 21st and go to the bank and cash them all at one time. So if you have sent me a check, it'll be a couple of weeks before you'll see it uh, go through. Uh, but that'll just make that'll make it one trip to the bank rather than who knows how many, because I would go get a whole bunch of money. Checks would come in. I'd, I'd make the deposits and cover it with my money. And, uh, and I had to do that four or five times. So I'm just going to do one big check deposit this time. So uh, please take care of that so that I don't have to uh, try to deal with that on the day that we are actually presenting. And, oh, by the way, Stephen, and, and in case some of you may not know, the leadership decided to do, again, what we did last year. We're splitting it four ways. Uh, Steve Campbell does so much for this group with a setup and all of that kind of stuff. He transports the pies for pH, which we've all come to love, and, and just so many things. So we've decided it's a, it's a four-way split between Steve Ellis, Stephen Kratz, Rick Strunk, and Steve Campbell. So uh, just for you four guys, you must be present to win, okay? <laughs> If you're not here, if you're not here on the 21st, I will find something to do with your share, okay? Just be sure you deposit my check that I gave you uh, in time so that if it does bounce, I can get money back in the account. All right. Hey, everybody, we love you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being on Zoom. Thanks for being here in person. God bless you.